the Columbus Metropolitan Club. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. Hello, I'm Anthony McIntosh. I am president and COO of Uprise and a proud member of the CMC Board of Trustees. All right, so we're gonna give some thank you now to some of our sponsors. So first, thank you goes out to our CMC's Optimal Health Series partner, the OSU Wexner Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital. Let's give them a round of applause. Come on. We also want to thank today's forum sponsor, Cardinal Health. Cardinal Health, come on. Uh, and today's live stream is presented by the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch. Thank you. Thank you all. So, suicide is Ohio's hidden epidemic. Each year, one in five Ohioans takes their own life. To combat this, a group of community-based professionals created the first suicide prevention plan for Ohio in 2020. Their goal is a vision of no more lives lost in Ohio to suicide. If you or someone you know is at risk of self-harm, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Veterans and their families can also connect with counselors by texting 838255. September is National Suicide Prevention Month, and today we will meet five leaders working to raise awareness and to implement a strategy to help stop Ohio's suicide epidemic. So with that in mind, we're going to welcome and honor our panelists who are here today to help have this great conversation. So first we have Dr. John Ackerman, Suicide Prevention Coordinator with the Center for Suicide Prevention and Research at Nationwide Children's Hospital. John, thank you. We have Tony Coder, Executive Director of the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation. We have Fran Frazier, founder of Black Girl Rising. And we have Doug Wolf, CEO of Boys and Girls Club of Central Ohio. And our host for today, we have Tia Marcel Moretti, President of Ohio Market for Lighthouse Behavioral Health Solutions. You can learn more about today's speakers on the back of your forum, but for now, I am going to turn it over to Tia. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. What a great turnout and a beautiful panel. Um, folks that I've had a great pleasure of working with many years over. So to be here together today to talk about the great work that you've done and to be able to moderate and facilitate that is a great honor. Suicide is a devastating public health problem that affects Americans and our families every year. After having lost four members of suicide in my own family, I've been personally impacted by the adverse effects of mental health, mental illness, and the surrounding stigma. It's been a great honor for me to have had a career that allows me to focus on shifting systems and policy to create more access to care for more people with behavioral health issues while reducing stigma and increasing protective factors. As a licensed social worker and Ohio certified prevention consultant, I've had the unique pleasure to work with and know many of the panelists today and many of you in the room. I admire your work. I'm honored to walk alongside of you. I'm honored to honor the families and those people that we have loved and lost. This is hard and painful work. These are tough and necessary conversations. And today we have brought together four amazing leaders to enlighten us on this difficult subject. To many of, this, to many of us, this conversation is deeply personal. And at any time and during this presentation or afterwards, please take care of yourself. Have conversations, utilize 988, Utilize the beautiful and amazingly talented professionals that surround us in this room and keep these conversations going. With that, I'd like to start out with my first question for Mr. Tony Coder. Um, Tony, as the leader and with your purview across the state, could you please brief us on a few sentences on the state of the state of suicide 
in Ohio? Um, suicide is uh, rising um, in the state. A lot of folks think that we may have hit a peak um, during the pandemic. Um, however, uh, suicides actually dropped. Um, they dropped to 1,641 deaths um, in 2020. Uh, you think, well, what, that sounds strange. Um, why, you know, why would that happen? We know that during uh, times of crisis, national uh, event, you know, national tragedies, that suicides actually decrease. Um, it's the uh, 6, 12, 18 months after that we start to see those increases again. Um, some of the other things that we're really uh, concerned about um, is the rise of um, African-American suicide. Um, in the last two decades, um, African-American suicides have risen 169% um, across the country. Uh, we know that LGBTQ plus um, youth and adults um, have higher rates of suicide. Um, uh, veterans, um, uh, veterans were mentioned, where we lose 20, you know, 22 a day. Um, and then also, uh, as we talk about uh, this, we can't forget about our, our, our largest population. Our largest population of, of folks dying by suicide are men, 80% of our deaths by suicide in the state are 35 to 65 year old men. Um, so it's not just a kid issue. Um, I, 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 uh, I also believe I just saw some stats that showed that uh, the highest rates um, are folks 85 and above um, for suicide. Um, and I just uh, talked to uh, um, the coroner a few days ago about an 89 year old uh, gentleman who took his own life. So, I mean, these are conversations that, that have to be had, and it impacts everybody. This is not a kid's issue. This is an everybody issue, and we all need to uh, uh, band together uh, to combat it. Thank, Thank you, Tia. You, Tony. Dr. Ackerman, Tony mentioned some special populations, um, including children, but LGBTQ, people of color, veterans, the aging population. Um, can you talk a little more about the, what the data indicates to you and the work that you and your groups are doing? Uh, what would you like us to know about what we're doing about those people who are disproportionately impacted? Sure, I think that's a great question, Tia, and thank you all for being here. I think we're going to get to the idea that part of the solution is bringing together folks from all different populations, age groups, advocacy groups, and really building partnerships. Uh, really, t Tony was able to hit on some of the, the key trends. Uh, for a long time, we've had really difficult outcomes and, and, and deaths by suicide in groups that are marginalized, that are made to feel less than because of who they are. Uh, there was a, a young man that I talked to from the Boys and Girls Clubs of America yesterday who, who gave a story, and his story was one that as soon as he was able to be his authentic self, in his case, as a, a gay Cuban immigrant who came to this country and is now at Columbia University and doing really great advocacy work, this is the kind of thing that we need to do more of. We need to create space where people can be their authentic selves. And when you look at specific groups, whether they've encountered racial trauma, whether they've been marginalized for not being able to express their sexual orientation or gender identity, these are types of things that may seem like, oh, it would be nice if we were able to acknowledge individuals for who they are. But this is life-saving work. When you create representation of individuals for who they are in spaces that allow them to grow, take advantage of the resources, and, and begin to move forward in a way that allows them to influence their communities, that is suicide prevention. So I know it's getting a little bit away from the, the data question, but whenever you have someone who feels hopeless, like a burden, and who learns ways to take action on those suicidal thoughts, that's when you have increases in suicide rates. So the more we create pathways of hope, the more we create connection for kids who have struggled with connection over the last several years and who have opportunity to see themselves, that's when you will start to see big changes. So it's going to take all of us to do that work. Thank you. And as Dr. Ackerman mentioned, um, Ms. Frazier, can you talk a little bit about how black girls are impacted and your thoughts on increasing protective factors such as resiliency for those young ladies? You know, the mission of Black Girl Rising is research and evaluating the ways in which black girls live their lives. And we looked, especially in the areas of trauma and resiliency. We provide girls with opportunities and experiences for critical thinking and helping them with an analysis of their own behavior and the world around them, we engage them in assessing the issues that 
impact their daily lives and how best to navigate their way. Bouncing back for black girls must become a honed skill. That's what resiliency looks like, bouncing back. Um, I, I want to put some things into perspective. According to a study in 2019, which was published by the Journal of Community Health, the actual suicide death rates for black girls ages 13 to 19 increased by 182%. In 2019, as the CDC was working on their study, there was a 15% increase compared to 9% of white girls and 12% of Hispanic girls. In Columbus, when we did our research, we surveyed 101 black girls in Columbus. Out of that group, 15% daily practice suicide ideation. So resiliency is a protective factor, but it's built on a combination of protective factors, like having supportive friends instead of associates. Girls always talk about having associates, very rarely talk about friends. Families who actually care who are present, and adults like teachers who do the extra work, coaches, church members, uh, but also living in a community where youth are appreciated. When we did our survey of 411 black girls in four Ohio cities, less than half believed that the community neighborhoods they lived in actually appreciated who they were, actually cared about the youth in that street, on that block, in that community. So our girls need, and, and our boys too, have to have a foundation of strength. They actually have to know who their people are, where their ancestors come from. How did black people overcome slavery and, and the insidiousness of racism in this country? Where are the strengths that our children can actually build on, build on from you who interact with them? So when you know who your people are, you know where you come from, you know what your people have overcome, um, that's literally how you build resiliency. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking about risk and protective factors, um, Doug, you and I go way back uh, working in the prevention space and really seeing the magic of those protective factors, just simply having a loving, supportive third-party adult that is not their parent um, and what that can yield. In, young people knowing who they are. So can you talk and share with us a little bit about, we hear the buzzword social emotional learning or education. Um, will you educate us a bit on that and then talk about your um, experience and views on those protective factors? Uh, th thanks, Tia. And uh, I'm far too young to go way back in anything. Oh, so. all right. Um, but. Uh, I, I do appreciate first the CMC for hosting the conversation and all of you for, for showing up. Um, probably not the most, uh, uh, when you think about going out for lunch, this is probably not the topic you want to discuss, but it, it's important that we're here. And I think uh, Fran teed it up nicely in, in, in my professional and personal experiences in this space. We learn about many protective factors, coping skills, appropriate and timely access to healthcare and means restriction. Uh, it largely comes down to positive, trusting, caring, consistent relationships. Um, and for our kids, it's with, with our adults and their, their peers. And we do know that the positive relationships at home and in the community is associated with decreased attempts in suicide amongst teens. And, and really, the, the relationship building was the genesis of uh, a suicide prevention effort uh, that we at Boys and Girls Clubs in Central Ohio started with Dr. Ackerman and Nationwide Children's and then ultimately with some support from Tony and the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation. Um, and uh, Dr. Ackerman just got back from DC this morning talking about that very, very project. So, so thank you for advocating there. But the work resulted from a, a four week period in which we had three young people in our clubs disclose suicidal ideation two verbally to staff, one in a journal in which she was writing, uh, and the instructions were clear, uh, write in your journal, staff are gonna read and follow up, and she disclosed. 
Um, there's a little bit of panic. Three in, in four weeks uh, sounds like a lot. We serve over 4,000 kids a year. Statistically, there's many more. So the concern was, uh, yes, around those three young people that, that disclosed, um, but also about all the young people who aren't talking about their concerns. Um, so uh, Dr. Ackerman, I uh, immediately went to work to, to figure out how to make uh, this work. We were responding with intentionality, uh, but we, we weren't in a place where we were really looking and listening and identifying those preventive factors and then acting on them, which is sometimes the hardest thing to do, is, is finding yourself in a situation where you literally have to use the words, are you thinking about killing yourself? And asking a young person that question. Um, but we, we launched that pilot effort in, in 2019, and now it's expanded nationwide. I'll, I'll tell you, it, it's, it's working. Um, we, every year, run a, a survey called the National Youth Outcomes Initiative. It's a benefit we have as being part of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America Network. It's the largest held uh, youth database in the country. And in 2022, 90% of our members said they can understand and talk about how they're feeling. And 89% say there is an adult in the club that listens and understands me when I talk about my feelings. And, and that is a big deal. Um, which leads to the, the next part is, is you and, and, and us. Uh, we have to take care of ourselves as well. It's incredibly difficult to support our young people when we're managing those same kind of emotions. So um, self-care is critical. Um, and, and as part of that, even we've launched in the last, I think, three weeks, uh, a You Matter initiative at Boys and Girls Clubs of Central Ohio offering free mental health coaching to all of our staff. Uh, and 50% uh, scheduled a first visit in the first two weeks. Um, so uh, back to Tony's point, I think it's, it's not just kids, it's us too, and, and we, we cannot help our kids appropriately if we're not taking care of ourselves. Thank you, Doug. Um, and I think that as we kind of pivot our questions and conversation now to the great opportunities, I don't want us walking away feeling downtrodden by the statistics. They are real, we need to address them as a community. But I'd like to spend a little time um, talking about the things that we're doing, such as increasing training and access to care. So my next question is for Tony. Full disclosure, Tony and I and some of my former colleagues in the room worked diligently for 16 months to examine uh, claims data at CareSource to look at what was happening um, to those CareSource members in the days and weeks leading up to a suicide attempt. And in the learnings, we have long operated under the understanding that people disengage within a 30 days of a suicide attempt or taking their life. What we found that claims data over 16 months, and as I understand, is still moving along and has expanded to other MCOs, was vastly different. It really yields great opportunity for providers. Tony, can you talk about that work and talk about some of the findings? Um, yeah, thank you, Tia. Um, and it has been absolutely tremendous. So I know we have some folks out there from CareSource, and uh, you know, Tia and uh, Jose uh, have been instrumental um, in, in uh, making that uh, making that uh, work. Uh, MCOs are large companies, and to find uh, good, passionate people is really valuable, so thank you. Um, yeah, we, well, we always knew that 50% of people who died by suicide saw their primary care physician within a month of killing themselves. 50%, um, so we knew, I mean, it's, it's half of the folks. What are, I mean, what's going on? Are they getting referred, you know, are they getting uh, assessed or for, referred? So, um, and, and those were folks who, who died. What was so great about um, the, the work that uh, we're doing with CareSource um, and other uh, MCOs, uh, managed care organizations, was um, folks going in for suicide attempts. So uh, what was some of the things that were found were just over 50% of those folks that had come in for suicide attempts into the ER um, had not seen a mental health provider before. So they were disconnected from care. Uh, we knew that 30% of CareSource members had claims uh, with a primary care physician within two weeks of their suicide attempt. Going back to our data about, you know, primary care is a, is a key opportunity to save people's lives. The surprising thing that it was really shocking was um, for young people um, were that 20% uh, of the young people uh, under the age of 18 um, had seen a, uh, a dentist or an eye doctor uh, within uh, two weeks. I mean, it's like, you know, and I'm not, you know, any dentist, I'm not saying you guys are making people kill themselves, so don't get that. <laughs> 
But what I am saying is those are per perfect opportunities to intervene and to intersect before that, that young person, uh, those adults, uh, you know, to take their own lives. So I'm so grateful for the work that you do. Um, and it is only, you know, I, I go to a lot of conferences and a lot of social workers. This, to me, is the most valuable thing I'm going to do all week because it is folks that are out in the community. It's all of those, those fancy uh, corporations that are out there because we have to be in this together. Um, and you are so key to preventing suicides, and I'm so grateful that you're here for the conversation. Thank you, Tony. Absolutely. Just um, the 50% the have not connected with healthcare. It just, again, highlights how important it is to build the relationships in those places where our young people are, in boys and girls clubs, in schools. Uh, that's where they're going to disclose. Uh, and then the partnerships with healthcare that allow us to create some seamless, warm handoffs uh, so they get the care they need. Uh, that's not our, it's not our job, it's not our skill set, but they trust us and they'll tell us. So while we're kind of fixing the healthcare system, if you will, and increasing access, it's important that, that kids are engaged with organizations like ours because they do trust us. That's right, thank you. And it's important that we wrap providers around with the tools and resources to not be afraid to ask the questions. Dr. Ackerman, um, I know that as we talk about things we're doing and opportunities for prevention and intervention, I know that you, you've done some pretty important research and I think you're hot on the heels of Columbus Airport uh, presenting on that research. Can you talk a little bit about what you and your colleagues have recently uh, researched and published? Well, I, if I could also add to the last couple of comments as well, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the key findings is that we're not particularly good at predicting specifically who and when someone is going to attempt to end their life. So one of the things that we're continuously sort of evaluating the data and look at is what are these strategies that we can take to reduce the chances that someone uh, who may be at risk, vulnerable at a, a general level, what can we do to actually be helpful? And I think what we're seeing more and more of is we need to do this work really upstream. We need to take an approach where we assume that everyone has some level of risk. And it's just much more realistic and easier to take the approach that some person could encounter a, 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 a series of variables or they could have some underlying risk. And what do we need to make sure that everyone has the space and the opportunity to reach out? But even better than saying reach out, ask for help when you need it, is if we're the ones reaching out to the individuals who are struggling so that we don't put the burden on them. So I think that's what a lot of these, these great programs by the panelists are advocating for and running and doing this really amazing suicide prevention work because they're creating opportunities for people to talk about mental health. Um, some, of the, some of the research that I think is key and is, is speaking to these opportunities is the fact that you've got, you've got um, increases in risk among individuals who aren't feeling seen or heard, as we talked about before. Um, black youth under the age of 12 are twice as likely to, to end their lives by suicide than white youths. But then also in rural communities, there's an increasing risk as well. Individuals who experience trauma and loss, especially if it's a loss to a loved one or someone they care about in an unexpected way, such as suicide is a risk factor. And what we see is increasingly young people are experiencing more risk around both self-injury and suicide. So if you look at when kids are starting to talk about suicide, think about it and actually take action on it, it's getting earlier and earlier. I could speculate about things like like media use and connection and disconnection and identity and all these things. We don't have amazing, we don't have a wonderful um, coherent picture around that. We're starting to do better, but I think we do have a coherent picture around what are the things that work. Things like reducing access to medicines, to unsafely stored firearms, to things that we can do something about, to screening in primary care, to getting help in clubs, in schools, in places where kids are, so that we're not having kids show up in an emergency room for the first time. It is incredibly inefficient, it's traumatic, and it's really problematic when the first time kids experience interaction with a healthcare provider, it's in a, a really difficult, 
uncontrolled state where they're not, the, not really the, the opportune time when folks are really stressed out. So I do have the good fortune of my wife being an integrated care uh, psychologist in a primary care setting. So she sees kids for mental health reasons while they're at their primary care visit. I think things that are integrated in schools and primary care offices where their needs can be met in a, before they escalate to the biggest problems and when it's done universally at an early age is the best possible way to approach this. Thank you. I'm going to go a little off script here uh, because I want to pick your brain. We know that for the last 50 or 60 years that community behavioral health has kind of been the net for these things. And as we start to have more open, honest conversations, we start to be able to explore research and look at opportunities. Do you feel comfortable commenting on the role of community behavioral health and where do we need to step up? What, where do we need to be in these places to support all of your work? Well, a couple of things. I think we, we need better training among clinicians. We need very suicide-specific care models. Um, you, you'd be surprised, despite suicide being the second leading cause of death among kids, a lot of folks aren't trained in, in counseling programs, social work, psychology, whether you name it, in a way that's very, it's very evidence-based and, and, and guided by these principles. So we got work to do professionally, like my, our discipline, my discipline has work to do. But then you also need to make sure that uh, you've got these, these networks in place because kids aren't always gonna disclose suicide risk to the people we want them to. We adults want them to go to the people who are most prepared, but kids aren't going to go to the people who are most prepared. They're gonna go to their friends. They're gonna go to individuals in, um, you know, in spaces that aren't necessarily getting specific training, coaches, peers, um, you know, mentors. And so I think we have to do a better job to teach people to be part of the pathway, not make everyone a therapist. That's, you know, not everyone wants to spend all their time in grad school and, and, and do, that, do that route. But everyone can play a role. And I think that's what each of you can do. And maybe, maybe it could be a, a take-home take assignment from today. We can all, all be part of that loop. Did you just give us homework? I did. Thank you, Dr. Call it a, we, well, we don't use homework in therapy. We call it a, a project. It's, or we call, we call it an in-between session project. Yeah, but we all know it's homework. Um, <laughs> so, Ms. Frazier, can you talk about, um, in your work, what, what are opportunities for us to get involved? I know we talked about elevating worth and um, protective factors, but what are you doing, and how can we become involved? Hmm. Okay, so I was prepared to answer the question about how do we best protect black girls from depression and suicide? And I think it fits That's in right. very nicely. Yeah. Um, it, truthfully, I'm not sure we can actually protect black girls from depression or suicide risk, but I do think we can be really proactive in helping our girls to understand those factors that build depression. So you can go from being sad, but then if that sadness isn't relieved in some way, then it can start to build. Because girls worry. And actually we're kind of programmed to worry about every little thing. So I think that we can do a better job at that. Um, but here's the thing about girls of color. We worry about how you see us. Mm. We worry about our color. We worry about bigotry and misogyny. Um, girls have said some incredible things about what they consider to be some of the real critical issues that they worry about every day. And it literally can start to erode your resiliency or, or your strength. And they start feeling depressed, isolated, overburdened with responsibilities and worries that really don't even belong to them but such is their life. So imagine looking in a mirror every day and wondering why the world doesn't like you because you're female or that you're black or wondering what someone will say to you that day about your hair. Can they touch it? Um, or you sure are pretty for being a black girl. Or 
I can't imagine you're so smart. How did you get to be so smart? And so these are the things that you carry with you. And you try to brush them off. But somebody is always looking at you, and you never know whether they're looking at you because of who you are, or are they looking at you because you are black and articulate. Always something. So one of the things that Black Girl Rising has to do, we have to change that paradigm. So when we talk to girls, we ask them, what are the issues that are affecting your mental and emotional health? And the girls identified six that they felt really impact their lives on a daily basis. And not just from the overall community, but literally right inside the black community. So it's colorism, it's body shaming, it's bullying, it's teen depression, it's homophobia in the black community. So looking at LGBTQIA issues. And lack of conflict resolution skills. So you know most children, all children learn their first ways of dealing with conflict by the adults around them. So depending on how you deal with conflict, pretty much is how our children begin to deal with conflict. So when we did our survey, 411 girls, out of 411 girls, only 16%, maybe 35, said that they actually had skills to resolve conflict. One of the things that we found out is that a girl's blood pressure goes up when she is in aggressive mode. So at one of our schools, we had the girls start taking their pulse rate when they thought they were ready to fight. So what is this doing to your body? How can we help your body simmer down so that you can think a little bit straighter? So we conduct lots of self-care training for our girls. Yoga, mindfulness, aromatherapy, learning how to breathe, affirmations, vision boards, and referrals to mental health practitioners who look like them. Mm -hmm. Very important. Because the hope is that if you look like me, or you care about me in such a way that I know you actually see me, then I'll listen to you a little bit differently. And I'll be willing to hear what you have to say. Our mental health campaign started in 2016 with the, I have to do a little shout out right now to the Adam Board uh, because they are always with us, always supporting what we do. Um, so we started this mental health campaign and we have continued it. Um, so we're now, we've probably touched now maybe about 1,500 girls. The last thing I want to tell you that we're doing is something that's coming up September 29th through October 2nd. So last year, I'm sure most of you remember, uh, Micaiah Bryant, 16-year-old black girl, was killed by a police officer. A lot of us got really concerned about what that message was to other girls of color in our city. And so we decided not to start another organization, not to get a number 501c3, not to do any fundraising, but how could we literally love up black girls in our city? And so we invited women to read love letters to black girls over the radio. It was a great success. So what we've done now is we've taken all of those love letters that black women, white women, Latinx women, have um, written and put them in a book. And so from September 29th to October 2nd, in libraries, in community organizations, we're gonna come to you, and, um, uh, and at the Kelton House, um, we are having women reading love letters to black girls for four days. Every girl will get a book, and um, 
and our plan is to just love girls up, just to say we see you, we value you, you are important, we love you. Um, because we think it's really, really important to begin to do that on a regular basis. Uh, every now and then, somebody needs to look at you with a lot of love mm -hmm. so that whatever it is that you think you might be concerned about or worried about uh, can like shift to the side just for a little bit. You know, if you're in school and you know that there are adults who love you or at least act like they love you during the day. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of takes the worry off just a little bit, and it makes it easier to tell somebody that you're not feeling so well. Um, so we're just creating opportunities for our girls to connect with some of the most fabulous, wonderful women in our city, many of you who are right here in this room. and. Um, so this is how we're trying to protect our girls, Tia. You got it, yes. <laughs> and, um, and changing that paradigm. Thank you, Fran. So we'll move to questions from our live stream and in-person audience in just a few minutes. If you have a question, please make your way to the microphone now. Um, if you're watching online, please type your questions into the chat. But before we take those audience questions, I have one final question for the panelists. And I'll start with Doug and move our way forward. Um, my question to you is, what do you want to say? This is an important conversation. It's an opportunity to get involved. I want everyone to leave with hope that they have a role. What would you like folks to know today? It's a, it's a real dangerous proposition to give is. me an open mic and tell me to say what I want to say. <laughs> but, um, I'll say this, uh, we ask what we can do as a community, and I think there's three things that um, you might consider doing uh, as you leave this room, and I'll challenge you to do those. The first one is take care of yourself, um, whatever that means for you, um, whether that means counseling or uh, a walk in the park or watching the birds or reading a book, take care of yourself. Um, the second is uh, pay attention, um, whether it's your child or a, a child at work, um, turn your phone off, um, really listen and really watch because their words are telling you something, but their behaviors, how they move, how they say the words are telling you something as well. So really pay attention. Um, and the last one is um, if you have concerns, say something. Again, it's a really hard question to ask, um, but I promise you if you do say something and uh, and a young person's thinking about harming themselves, that is a weight off their shoulders and an invitation to talk about it with a trusted adult. Take care of yourself, turn your damn phones off, <laughs> and uh, ask if there's concerns. Thank you. Um, and Tony and Dr. Ackerman, I'd like to give you the same opportunity. We have just a couple minutes. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like to share? Tony? Um, first off, I want us to go out of this room seeing this as a health care issue. This is not a social service issue. This is not a law enforcement issue. This is a health care issue. Mental health has it right in its name, health. Mental health has to be a health issue. So we have to start seeing it as that. Um, some of the, uh, we also have to improve the system of care. The handoffs that we have, my son uh, spent 13 days in a mental health facility. That's why I'm in this job. Never thought I would be in this job. But when I saw what happened to him after his struggles with suicidality and, and coming home to an empty apartment, not giving support, them saying, if you miss three appointments, we're gonna cut you off. We've got to, do, we've got to stop that. I mean, that, that's, that's ridiculous. So um, two things that you can do, call your legislator uh, for House Bill 468 and ask them to require funding. House Bill 468 is the 988 bill. Um, Jan, uh, June of 2023, 988 runs out of money. Runs out of money, no funding. We're gonna go back to, you know, uh, Erica having to foot the entire bill for crisis services. And I, I'm talking about Erica Clark Jones, my, my buddies. Uh, so sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I am asking for a 50 cent fee on every cell phone in the state. 50 cents, $6 a year. 
would provide $54 million to the crisis system in this state of Ohio that we could pay for 988. We could pay, we know that uh, we got 72,000 calls last year to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 72,000. The other thing is, call about House Bill 616 and tell them to please, don't pass that, but don't say gay bill. Seriously, you wanna crush the spirits of folks who have already been, um, have already been, uh, you know, already have issues with feeling that they're important and valued, that, that's just going to be an issue that is going to be uh, uh, an, another, uh, another trouble. Um, so I encourage you to, to call your legislator and be part of uh, you know, improving this system that we have. Thank you, Tony. Dr. Ackerman, I know we're just at time, yeah. but I did want to honor my word before we turn to those questions. Hard to top that. I just want to thank all of you in the room who are, who are taking part of this work. And I will say, I'll, I'll extend the time by saying I just, we just released an open access book on youth suicide best practices and prevention that's accessible because it's free with 18 chapters that go into what we believe are the most critical issues around youth suicide prevention and what we can do about it. So a quick summary, short reads, what we can do about it are a call to action, and I think that is um, something that can be hopefully helpful for folks. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman. Yep. Lainey, our first question. Hi, I'm going to be um, providing questions from our online audience, and we will go every other one. So if you have in-house, you want to ask questions, we'll give you that time. Um, at the Westerville Public Library, they ask, does the panel have an opinion on healing circles or listening circles having a um, positive impact for high school kids, and is it demonstrable? Does anyone want to take that? I, 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 can, I, I can respond generally. I think any time we give young people a safe environment to talk about how they feel with others, um, it creates opportunities for productive dialogue. Um, I think it's important to have a, a trained adult in that space to guide the dialogue. Um, but uh, maybe I'll pass it to Dr. Uh, Dr. Ackerman for some uh, more intelligent remarks on that. No, no, you, you, really, you really hit on it. I'm not aware of any of the data that suggests it's a strongly evidence-supported practice, but I would definitely agree, like giving individuals an opportunity to have a voice is important, but you do want it to be in a space with informed consent. You want everyone who's part of that to be like indicating that they're ready and prepared to be in that space and really be vulnerable because it can be traumatic if a person's forced to disclose things that they're not ready to. Can I so, just quickly um, want to say that there, there, there is data uh, and evidence that sister circles, uh, healing circles actually do work. Um, it is important to have ground rules uh, and those ground rules need to be developed by the girls themselves. Um, it is important to have someone who knows how to facilitate and not talk, so that the talking is literally owned by the girls or the youth in the group. Um, and I think the intentions of why they're gathering um, has to be laid out very clearly as well, um, because that's what will keep them safe. But I. It is definitely a, a great model to use. Um, I would only add that during my time in the governor's office, we surveyed um, several regulatory boards, and more often than not, 80% of the time, providers were saying that they don't ask the question because they're afraid that it will prompt someone to commit suicide. So I would say that where we are creating safe spaces to have conversations and providing that in reach and knowing how to get resources would be key. Hi, Hi, Jeff. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. Jeff with Geosite. Um, thanks to the panelists for, for uh, doing this. This is a really, really important topic, and I learned a lot. Um, Mrs. Frazier started answering my question, so I was going to ask the whole panel here. So uh, you were talking about blood pressure correlating um, you know, with the fight or flight response. Um, so I was wondering if there's any other like functional, non-invasive biomarkers that are kind of under investigation to understand, uh, you know, whether young people or, or people, any, anyone really is, you know, undergoing a, a mental health crisis, you know, because inherently it's, you know, we, we could talk about risk, um, but, you know, this is a, an issue where it's internal for the patient and it's a, it's a question of be becoming external where they tell somebody and try to get help. But, you know, if we're looking for something like something as simple as blood pressure, 
you know, you can measure that with your watch. Um, is, are there other initiatives or other biomarkers in research right now that, that might be able to tell us about, you know, how to help people? Yeah, I can, I can just add, it's not my area of expertise, but there's a, an approach called ecological momentary assessment strategies, and they will look at physiological changes, brain changes, other, other sort of short-term areas, because again, we, we said it's really hard to predict suicide risk and changes for someone who's sort of dipping into what looks like risk is more like an EKG than it is like this smooth sloping curve. And so uh, they're beginning to look at some of those biomarkers, but um, that's, I, would, I would point you to some of the work of Mac, Matt Nock and others who are, who are really doing some uh, fantastic work in that, but I will, I will defer to those experts. Um, I uh, neglected to say, we wanted to thank, CMC would like to thank um, Jose Rodriguez for bringing this topic to us, and thank you very much for helping us with this panel. How early should we begin? <laughs> How early should we begin um, talking with children about suicide? I also have uh, from Yolanda Clay, she would like to know from uh, Fran, is the book available for her granddaughter? Oh, I'll just answer that very yeah. quickly. Yes, the, the book will be available the, the 29th of September. And if um, she wouldn't mind going to our website, blackgirlrising.net, um, information will be there. Yeah, I can, I'll briefly discuss the, the age piece. Um, it, you, you really want to give kids the tools to discuss big feelings from a very young age. I kind of have some partners who do amazing work um, at, at Nationwide Children's in early childhood mental health. Um, and it's, it's really all about helping someone first be able to label their emotions, understand them, communicate them, move forward. And sometimes those emotions, we know kids as young as six or seven have had thoughts, actual thoughts about not wanting to be alive right now and being able to act on that. So we need to give kids tools, and we need to make sure that individuals um, as young as six, seven, eight, in developmentally appropriate ways, which doesn't mean overwhelming them with terminology, it doesn't mean sensationalizing or scaring kids, it means giving them a, a sort of a scaffolded way to understand emotion, their emotions and how to express it and let them know when they're in a crisis who to go to. So you start just like, what do you do? Very simply, concretely, when you think about uh, dying or not wanting to be alive, and then and then all the way up to as kids are getting older. I would say as soon as fourth or fifth grade, we need to have specific conversations about those feelings of wanting to die, and again, developmentally appropriate ways, not overwhelming. And then you know by by middle school, gosh, you have to have had this conversation. And high school, where most of our programming occurs, is way too late. I'll I'll end there. Well, I think to add to that. Uh, John, and, and he's the expert. Uh, I call him all the time and uh, say, well, John, what am I doing? Um, so, and he always tells me what I'm doing, uh, which is good. Uh, but I also think that um, no matter, you know, if your child comes to you, make sure that you're supportive of the conversation, that you don't say something like, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? Because that simple, the way you reacted automatically puts that child on guard and, okay, I can't talk about this. So, you know, it's how you handle that conversation um, and then be ready. Uh, I tell parents all the time, you know, have a, uh, you know, if you're worried about your child, have a little referral sheet in your wallet or, or you know, somewhere that you're able to, to call either, whether it is 988 or uh, Nationwide Children's or, you know, uh, Doug and, and some of his team over, over uh, just having those conversations, it's also how you respond and not letting that, not, not having that child feel like, uh, wow, this, this, was a bad, this was a bad idea. I'll add in five seconds or less to you, I, I promise. Um, <laughs> And again, it comes, the conversation starts with how you behave too. So again, it, I think it comes, comes back to self-care. Are you modeling that for the young people around you? Are you, uh, when you're down and depressed, are you going in a hole and, and hiding and going away and showing them that's the way you manage your grief and stress? Those, it, we gotta model that ourselves and take care of ourselves to be able to have those conversations as well. Can I just say, um, we conducted focus groups with about 60 girls and in every group, each girl said, if I could just get my mom to listen, not give me advice, just listen, maybe she could hear me. So I, I, I'm just 
saying, I, I, I think we need to do more listening. And it's not about, can I real yeah. quickly, um, just, it's definitely, it's not about <laughs> fixing everything right away. You're not gonna fix something that took all these years to develop or, or even weeks to develop. And then there are some really great resources on, on our sleeves that specifically talk about how to say this. So it can be vague, like how you approach it, but if you wanna like a line by line, what do I say when, that would be a really good resource because I think that's, that can be really important. Thank you, and just to highlight again Ms. Fraser's points that young people are always watching us, so modeling what we want emulated. We have time for one more question. Um, I'm Nancy Trooks, and I'm a mental health therapist, and my question is a very practical one. My understanding is that NetCare will stop providing 24-hour care um, in November, and that's of concern to me. Um, and what will take its place? That's something that people can walk into and, and, and it's not the emergency room. So what's happening? So I can try to speak to that just from my um, relationships and previous understanding. I know that uh, we have great leaders in Franklin County and Columbus um, and great leaders of the state who continue to come to the table. Um, I know because Lighthouse, we are one of them, uh, willing to step in and serve uh, and provide services as rapidly as we can. And our leader of the Adam Board, uh, Ms. Erica Clark-Jones, has done a hell of a job raising um, the dollars necessary to put us on a track in the next 24 months to have a comprehensive no wrong door crisis center. So um, I appreciate the concern, it's a great concern to all of us. Uh, know that this community, I have seen them rapidly respond and I've seen the state respond as well as we continue to work together to find resolution. Thank you for your question. With that, I would like to invite Anthony McIntosh back up to the stage. I want to thank everyone for this uh, wonderful conversation. Anthony? Wow, I think that for, for, for me, you know, I, I practice learning something every day. And I think I have filled out my next 30 days in terms of what I have learned. It's just a totally different perception in terms of how you even think about uh, this issue. So I want to thank all of the panelists, uh, Dr. Ackerman, uh, Tony Coder, Fran Frazier, Doug Wolf, and Tia, you did a wonderful job facilitating this conversation. Just give them all a hand. You know, and, and the one thing we we'll always like to emphasize, you know, this isn't the end of the conversation, right? This is just this part of the conversation. If you haven't been part of it, this is the start. So get involved, continue the conversation. Uh, with that being said, I also want to thank the, our, our series partners, OSU Wexter Medical Center, uh, Nationwide Children's Hospitals. Uh, I want to thank our forum sponsor today, Cardinal Health. I also want to thank our online virtual seats participants as well as uh, the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream. Uh, again, let's thank the panel. I think this was a wonderful job on a tough subject. So thank you all again for sharing. Uh, and, and finally, if please make plans to join us next Wednesday for our CMC forum or our CMC meeting. This is a special evening event as starting at 5 p.m. here at the Bolt House. Uh, we'll dig into the power of the Columbus Way with Kenny McDonald, president and CEO of the Columbus Partnership, as well as Kevin Boyce, Franklin County Commissioner. Thank all of you for joining us. This doesn't happen without you, so give yourselves a, a hand or applause. So. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday at the Metropolitan Cl Columbus, the Columbus Metropolitan Club as we present another community conversation. Thank you.